Okay, here we go. So this question with respect to uh, this pollen uh, station on uh, how many pitches we can cover. We are at 64% saying A, 25B, nobody says C, 11% uh, says D. Well, that nobody says C is, is, is good. C is definitely not the right answer. Uh, D, unfortunately, is also wrong. So it's between uh, A and B. The correct answer, uh, unfortunately, is B. 25% uh, of people had it right. And the rest, oh my God, guys, I'm just, I'm just going to go out on YouTube. What are they going to think about work unions? <laughs> it's a disaster. So, so, okay. So here's the answer, right? The worked out answer. So, uh, so we're looking at a monolayer of particles, which in essence is a two-dimensional problem. So the, the reason why people went wrong is that they, they probably took the surface area of a sphere instead of the surface area of a circle. Uh, in this particular case, you need the area of a circle, so you're, because you're looking top down, yeah? So you're only looking at a monolayer. So, and then um, the only point where you come in is, is, uh, is how, am, how am I gonna arrange these particles in a monolayer? And I'm just gonna roll them out and randomly jam them, or I'm going to nicely order them, like put them one by one next to each other, right? And if you put them one by one next to each other, there's like kind of two things you can do. You either do it square packing or you do it hexagonal packing. So in 3D and 2D, the cases are slightly different and the packing densities are slightly different. And, uh, but you can work that out, right? So the area of a circle, you know, pi over 4, d to the power 2, and the volume of a sphere, pi over 60 to power 3 is what you need. So the area to volume ratio for the single particle in this case, noting that the area uh, you need um, is, is, is there uh, for a circle, is 3 over 2 times d. Yeah? Then you have to multiply this with the total volume of all the particles, which is the mass divided by the density. And then you have the actual total area covered by the particles. So that's, if you look top down, that's the graph you can't see anymore. Yeah? But because of the shape of these particles, and you can see in the picture, both in the square packing and the hexagonal packing, you have what we call interstitial spaces. There is space left in between. And effectively, you could argue that that space is obviously covered as well. Yeah. So, and for that, you need to know the packing densities. And with a little bit of uh, fiddling about on A-level geometry or high school geometry, you can work out that for square packing, this is pi over four. And for hexagonal packing, it's pi over six times uh, the square root of three. And then you get the value of the effective area covered, which is larger than the area you calculated before because of these interstitial spaces. And obviously in square packing, as you can see in the image, there are larger gaps between the particles than in hexagonal packing. So if you pack them according to a square packing, you must be able to cover most of these football fields. So the end then is you have to divide this by A, which is the total area of the new comp station. And what you come up with is that in hexagonal packing, you can cover 2.31 times the football stadium. And in square packing, you can do it 2.67 times. So with one kilogram of material of nanoparticles of density one, 100 nanometer monodispersed particles, you roughly can cover two and a half times a football stadium. That's pretty large, yeah? And this brings us to the point that area, surface area, suddenly starts to become very important. Because, you know, if you think about paint, yeah, waterborne paint is about 70% solids, yeah, and it's all kinds of colloidal matter in there. So the total surface area of one paint tin roughly will be the size of one of these football fields. That's a massive surface area. And therefore, 
forces that relate to surfaces are important. So let's have a look at that, what we have to um, look into. So this is something that you may or may not know. People that have done uh, Professor Pat Unwin's module on, uh, on surfaces might know this. Uh, maybe you might know this in the year two electrochemistry or something. Anyway, if you don't know it, it doesn't matter. Here it is. So um, this is quite an interesting area. It's called capillarity, and it's the study of, um, of interfaces between two immiscible liquids or in between a liquid and a gas. Liquid being something that can flow. So we're, we're talking about soft interfaces in a way. Yeah, you could even argue from a pure theory point of view that a gas in a way is a very, very low density fluid. Um, so, um, and the pioneers in this area, there's like three guys, Thomas Young, Pierre Simon Laplace, and Carl Friedrich Gauss, they, uh, they kind of coined this area. And, uh, and they came up with an idea that there has to be something which is called a surface tension or an interfacial tension. And why do they call it tension? And what exactly is it? Well, the easiest way to look at it is this picture on the right, which I just snatched from Wikipedia, which normally you shouldn't do, but in this case, it's roughly right. So, um, so you see a black dot in a fluid, in a liquid in this case, and the dot represents one of the molecules uh, of this liquid. And on average, uh, it has an interaction with its neighbors. So if you think of a liquid as a bucket full of ping pong balls, you're, you're kind of, that all you kind of move about, basically. You kind of want to think of one central ping pong ball. How does it interact with all the other ping pong balls around them? And obviously, the ones that are closest, it has the strongest interaction with, and then it kind of dampens out. So I don't know, people that do modeling, they may have heard of the radial distribution function or correlation function. And as a result of that, you see these nice um, interaction uh, diagrams that you can plot. Anyway, you have a bunch of interactions with neighboring molecules. And as a result of that, this is a liquid, right? You have an attractive force. You have a cohesive energy. If this would be a gas, if, if you would have an ideal gas and you basically reduce the volume, you just put the ping pong balls closer and closer and closer together and the pressure goes up, but it will never form a liquid. The ideal gas law cannot account for getting a liquid state. In order to do that, you have to have, an, in this case, an attractive force between the molecules, which is the cohesive energy between the molecules. And these arrows in this picture represent this cohesive, this cohesive energy. Now, if you go to the interface, you can imagine that you're gonna lose half of your cohesive energy. Yeah, you slice it and half of your cohesive energy is gone. And the molecules that are in the liquid on the interface suddenly have to touch something else. And they have to touch something they don't like, which causes tension. Hence the word surface tension or interfacial tension. And roughly, roughly, um, this interfacial tension is the cohesive energy divided by two, because you lose half of it, and then times a measure for the area of a particular molecule. So roughly this kind of works a little bit. So question, what are the correct units for surface tension? Millinewtons per meter, millijoules per square meter, millijoules per meter, or both answers A and B are correct. So um, let's have a go at this. And let's see what's going to happen. Okay. 
quick poll about, you know, some people say answer A, that's good. Answer A is right. Some people say answer B, that's also good because answer B is right. Luckily, nobody says answer C. So, but the correct answer is, uh, is the best answer is D because both A and B uh, are correct in this particular case. Well done. Well, someone pressed answer three. Fair enough, you know, someone had just woke up. So, uh, okay. So let's take a, let's take a little break because we've been uh, working for an hour. So let's, uh, let's have a little break here.